He had tremendous natural talent, you know, t t tremendous. He, he, he'd be walking about and all of a sudden he'd move, you know, and, 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 and uh, he had tremendous talent. I think he's one of the nicest men I've ever met. He's one of the greatest players I've ever seen. I think the word electric sums up Dennis Law, really, because he was so bright and he was sparks seemed to be flying everywhere whenever he was around. He was creating problems for defenders. If goalkeepers dropped the ball, even six inches, he was... He was like grease lightning and he had it in the back of the net. Oh, he's one of the all-time greats, isn't he? No doubt about it. Dennis Law was someone special. You'd never get people like Dennis Law. He was absolutely, I would think, probably one of the greatest players inside the box and goal scorers you've ever seen in your lifetime. Dennis is a, a dynamic, dynamic person. And I think he was a person that caught the spectator's eyes. You know, the long, blonde, flowing locks. His, Electric flying burst and tremendous uh, athleticism. And, you know, he scored goals, which everybody loved to see. Dennis Law was the king of Old Trafford, the hero of the Stretford End and one of the greatest players these islands have ever produced. Now he lives in retirement in Manchester, but we took him back to Aberdeen, to Printfield Terrace, where the story of the king started. I was born in Aberdeen and I was the youngest of seven. Uh, my father was a fisherman. He was a trollerman for, you know, I think, 40 years. I mean, I didn't really know my dad because in, in those days, my father would go to sea on a Monday morning and wouldn't come back until the Aberdeen. Saturday morning. Yeah, Aberdeen. Of course, he'd been Aberdeen. at sea all week, so Scotland. he'd be out after a few weeks on a Saturday. And then on Sunday, everybody had to keep quiet in the house because, of course, he had to have his rest. And then he was off on the Monday morning. So my mother really led a particularly hard life in that she had to keep seven. I mean, there was three brothers and three sisters, and I was the youngest, so... And it was just after the war as well. I mean, the war had finished in 45. I was born in 1940. And, you know, people were just becoming to uh, come to grips with the end of the war. Because there, was, there wasn't any food or whatever in the sort of late 40s. So I would say that it was a, a very hard life for everybody uh, involved. I think I was 15 before I really got my first pair of shoes, proper shoes, and that was on the slate anyway, you know, my father didn't know anything about that, of course, that was all hidden. But my father used to come up and see if I did get a pair of shoes, they were all, they were hidden under the bed or whatever, so he couldn't see them, and then they were taken out. When he went back to sea, his shoes were taken out. So it was a difficult time, yeah. He used to have a clothes pulley in the kitchen, and uh, tie a piece of string, and a ball of wool, so that uh, it's swung round uh, if it wasn't in contact with anything so that you could head it you know and uh, then you'd pull it up a wee bit and then jump and head it again and uh, oh it's just crazy George Geddes who lived next door to, to us in Printfield uh, he came from a a more well-to-do family and that you know they had hot water we, we, did, we only had hot water once a week he had it every day and I think it was only two of them in the family. So he had got a new pair of boots and therefore he gave me his other pair, which I think were a bit too big anyway. But of course they were treasured because it was the first pair of football boots I'd ever had or shined up, you know. And in those days he had wooden studs, you know, as well. I mean, you had to knock them in, bang. So I had them for, well, quite a while, two or three years, yes. Looked after carefully for that. Dennis was a kid who was into everything. My father, as well as was out the lot, as Dennis, the one who'll make a football player. He was scared of nothing. And then I went to Powers, which is, of course, is now St. Matthew's Academy in Aberdeen. And that was when you really got into uh, team football. And there was a guy called Bill Donner, of course, who was the woodwork teacher. He took all the, the football sides. And we, we had a very good team at school. He was unnatural. That's all you could see about him. He was just unnatural. And nothing more could be said. Natural was that a brain that thought we ahead of other boys, let's put it that way. We couldn't get competitive football, so there was a, a boys club called Abdeen Lads Club. So we got a hold of one of the parents in the street. Said, look, we're all going to join the club, but there's no one to run the team. So Mr. Thompson, he come along and he says, right, we've no money. We can have a team, you're all in the club, you've paid your shilling, we need money for strips. And we used to go around selling old things to you know, get money in to buy the kit and whatever you know so it was a good it was terrific so therefore we played we did that we played for the school 
on a Saturday morning and then for ALC Colts in the afternoon. Ben Wurzler told me, he says, what do you want to be? I said, I'm going to be an engineer. And I said to him, well, you can make a football player if you stick in. And he should have done it and he'd have made a football player. And what I wanted to be was to be an architect. You know, I wanted to be a draftsman because I was quite good at technical drawing at school. I was good at maths and reasonably good at English. So, you know, I was quite, uh, I mean, that's really what I wanted to do. So when Andy Beattie's brother, Archie Beattie, who lived just up the road from me, uh, Andy Beattie was manager of the house uh, and Archie did a bit of part-time scouting, came to the house one night to ask if I'd go down to the house That was the first time. And even then, when I eventually went down with, I went down with my two brothers, um, the last thing in my mind was actually to stay. I was going down for a fortnight, really from, from school, uh, to just go down there and see what it was all about. And the last thing in my mind was to become a player. But they obviously, they must have liked a little bit what they, what they saw in the sort of two little games that we had and decided to uh, have me stay down there. I just remember this little boy. I was just come out of the forces and I was in digs with three or four other lads. And uh, they said they a lad coming into the digs keep your eye on him, whatever. And he really didn't look much above 12 years of age. Uh, and again, everybody would say, oh, this lad's going to have no chance at all. Uh, but the next day, when he was out with the ball, different laddie altogether, yeah. Remarkable. There was no danger. I think everybody at the club uh, had never seen anybody as good as that at, at that sort of age. No, I had an awful squint in my eyes, so I, and I wore glasses. And when I played football as a boy, uh, I used to have to close the eye because I was so self-conscious, you know, because children are cruel, you know, they called me cockeyed and whatnot. So when I played football, I just had the one eye. So I only played really out of one eye all the time. And so therefore, when I came back and got the operation, it was like one of those films, you know. They, they obviously cut in here somewhere and pulled the eye so it was dead in the middle. And when the nurse unwound the bandages, you know, it was just like one of those films. I come off and I was able to go and, and look in the mirror. And for the first time in my life, there was my two eyes, dead straight. I thought, oh, Jesus, this is marvelous. Because now, apart from playing football, I could actually look at the girls as well. I mean, before, never even bothered with them. And it was the biggest change in my life ever. Dennis now began to thrive at Huddersfield, where he was joined by his school friend, Gordon Lowe. He was just so quick, you know, so quick and... Uh, I mean, everybody, you know, the, everybody said they wouldn't be at Huddersfield long. Uh, he was just you know, one of these unique players. At just 16, he was in the first team and marked as an obvious star for the future. Fortunately for me, I got in the team when I was 16 years of age. So I give the terracing and the sweeping the big elbow, <laughs> and the guard of them, they still had to do it. But of course, I was now big time. I was with the senior players. It was lovely. The man who inspired Dennis at Huddersfield was the late, great Bill Shankly. Well, I was fortunate in life to play under two of the greatest managers that the game has ever seen. Uh, Shankly, obviously, with Huddersfield, and then Busby later on in life when was with Manchester United. But that initial stage at Huddersfield with Shankly was one that will always stick with me because I was on... Don't forget, I was only a frail boy then. I was uh, somewhere like eight stone. And, you know, coming from a family that we didn't have much money, we didn't have, much, you didn't have the best of food or whatever. And Shank, he must have seen something in it somewhere along the line that this lad could be not too bad if he's sort of better fed. So Shanks used to put me to a local cafe across from, uh, from uh, Huddersfield's ground and got the landlady there to feed me on steaks, you know, an actual step, a whole steak to myself. See a dear. The food, coupled with Shanks's coaching and Dennis's natural ability, made him a target for other clubs. After four years, he was on his way to Manchester City. I mean, they still remember Dennis. They still talk about Dennis at Huddersfield as, as though he played, as though he was there for ten or fifteen years, and he wasn't there that long, really. But uh, uh, he really made his mark there. <laughs> Well, uh, it was 
I think, 53 or 55,000 pounds, which was enormous money, wasn't it? Uh, and again, in those days, there was no 5%, so, I mean, they didn't get anything at all. Um, but it was a huge fee, and, of course, the, that brought a lot of attention. Um, and people ask you, you know, does the fee bother you, you know? And obviously, the answer that you've got to give to the media, whatever, is no. The fee does not bother me one bit. That, of course, is complete lies. Because in the back of your mind, it is a huge burden. It was a burden that Dennis got used to, as three times he became Britain's most expensive player as he moved from Huddersfield to City for £55,000, from City to Torino for £110,000, and then from Torino to Manchester United for £115,000. But at Main Road, City did not really have a good enough side to give the country's costliest footballer the right platform for his talents, and his stay was to be short. They were still a big club, although they were, they were struggling. And to go there, and again, in those days, it would, huge crowds. I mean, 40,000 was not unusual, 45,000 to play. And, of course, the derby game with United, which came the next season, when it was a full house of, I don't know, 60-odd thousand. I mean, it was just the atmosphere was electric. And, of course, the rivalry between the two clubs uh, was enormous. I was skipper at the time then, of course, and I took him under my wing here. Um, but uh, he thought he'd left a better side than the Spiel New York that when he came to Manchester City. But you could tell there and then that, I mean, well, I, after seeing him, I mean, he covered every blade of the, of the pitch, you know, uh, up and down like the old inside forwards used to be. Although Dennis had begun his love affair with the city of Manchester, a parting was on the way. In 1960, British football was still suffering from the maximum wage, and the lure of the lira and the sunshine of Italy was great. Stars like John Charles, Jerry Hitchens and Jimmy Greaves were all linked with Italy, and now the Latin checkbooks were homing in on Britain's brightest talent. When something like that comes along, you could see the glamour or whatever on the other side. Always looks greener on the other side. And although the maximum wage had been abolished, when my new contract would come up and Manchester City offered me a lot of money to stay. I had made up my own mind that whatever happened, I was going to go to Italy. And that's the best way I did. Dennis was signed for Turino together with Hib star Joe Baker. But anyway, we got to Turin and we arrived there and it was fantastic. I couldn't believe the welcome we got in the Turin airport. That There must have been about 10,000 fans there and I said, what the hell are these? guys doing here and we found out that it was for us the problem we had was trying to get some uh, privacy and there was no way you could get it after saying from me uh, we were one of the the pioneers into Italian football well, when I get over there the people were lovely I mean absolutely lovely they made us so welcome still got great friends there to today but if it hadn't been for the football I would probably still be there, but the football was awful. Italy might have looked pretty idyllic, but it had turned into a nightmare. Hounded by the press off the field, scandal seemed to follow the British pair, and a car crash became huge news. And on the field, where tight marking and defensive football dominated, Dennis was desperate to escape. And I went back to the flat, that night, no Dennis. Wardrobe closed, wardrobe empty, no clothes. He'd done a runner. Fortunately, it was Matt Busby who came to the rescue. So Matt signed Dennis for another record fee, and Law was on his way to United. I'd come to a club which, of course, was, was a very famous club. And I had played under Sir Matt with Scotland, and I knew the man. And therefore, it was sort of the beginning, or hopefully could be the beginning of something good. The good started to show itself straight away in a long cup run. Top star of Southampton. The fact that I'd been in Italy, and under this sort of system of being marked, now I found that I had so much room to play football. It was like unknown. 
just manages to connect. Go! Had I not gone to Italy, I wouldn't have known. But I felt every time I could feel the star was going to score a goal. The Cup really rescued United's season. In the league, though, things had been more difficult. Leicester City in the final. It just shows you how things change, you know. We could have been down, and of course, everybody's saying, what a waste of money on Law. He's done this, he's not done that, I think. Jeez, and let, uh, ten others in the team as well. But then we played in the Cup final against Leicester City, who were the favourites for the Cup. In fact, they were favourites at that time to win the double. They had been doing well in the league, and, and they got caught on, on the, the Cup run as well because, of course, it was late in the season now. The season was extended by about five or six weeks, and they dropped out of the top sort of three in the, in the league, and now the Cup. But they were favourites, but it just shows you, you know, we all, we all clicked. David Hurd kicks off. Manchester United in red shirts, Leicester City in white. The Cup final has begun. This event, which in English football outshines all else, league championship or international. And it's Leicester City on the attack now. Time for United to apply the pressure. Ferran spots that inside left Dennis Law is well placed. Just watch how that Scottish wonder turns the pass to complete advantage. United have scored the all-important first goal. One good thing for United, Bobby Charlton's in great form. He shoots, it goes to Hurd, and it's in the net. On his feet again, Law initiates another attack. But United don't intend letting City off the hook. Danger man Dennis Law hits the post or he'd have scored again. Law just can't tear himself away from this Wembley turf. Tragically for Leicester, Banks fumbles. Ready to pounce on it is David Hurd. United's captain, Noel Cantwell, leads his men up to the Royal Box. For them all, it's the fulfilment of an English footballer's ambition. The cup and a cup medal. Incidentally, it's a moment of triumph for their manager, Matt Busby. Proof that he has most successfully rebuilt United. I mean, the actual thing of playing at Wembley uh, and, and to be in a winning team was absolutely marvellous. But to actually score a goal as well, that was a perfect day. If I remember the goal correctly, Craig was on the left uh, wing and he, he turned and knocked the ball in and it sort of went, came behind me, really. And I had to sort of half turn and I just hit it. It was a lucky shot, really. And it went and Banksy was sort of struggling to get it and it went in the corner for United's first goal. So they actually playing Wembley, playing a final, I mean, at Wembley and scored a goal. Perfect. Sorry, Garvin. Had to be done. That started really the beginning of a lovely time for Manchester United uh, because we'd won the cup but we're now in the European Cup Winners' Cup as well. Uh, we're in the Charity Shield final uh, and that next season a young boy came into the team who's only 17 years of age by the name of George Best. And of course, we all know what happened to Bestie and become one of the greatest players the game has ever seen. So I was lucky in that I not only had a great manager, Busby, also in the side were two world-class players, Charles Bobby Charlton and George Best, along with Pat Crerand and Nobby Styles, a good goalkeeper, Alex Stepney, and a nucleus of a side that was going to go on for the next five years anyway and win most of the honours that you could possibly win in the game. The 60s, George Best, the Beatles and Swinging London. And Dennis, the trawlerman's son from Aberdeen, was at the heart of it all. The 60s were about fashion, and no team was more fashionable than Manchester United. People say, what's he like? I say, well, you can be in a room with a thousand people or a hundred people in the room talking, and suddenly, you, without even looking, you know there's someone special in the room because he has that aura about him. Because we went out week after week, season after season, 
uh, never expecting to lose. You know, that's a tremendous feeling in any sport, knowing you're the best in the business. And we felt we were. Uh, uh, we never, I mean, today some teams think a draw away from home was a good result. If we got a draw, we were disappointed. I mean, the whole team just oozed of confidence in the fact that we'd won it to win the cup was lovely. But now we had to go out and win what you would like. Every player would really swap it for would be the league. Because not only to win the league, you had then entry into Europe, which was something that Busby had always set his uh, heart on, was winning the European Cup. So if we could go out and win the league, that was a first step in that direction. We didn't win it that next season in 64, but the following season we did win it. Uh, and we, that was the first time they'd won it since, you know, the late 50s. So it was fantastic to think that only seven years after the clash, Busby had, was now back in Europe. Man United topped the league in 1965, and for good measure, they won it again in 1967. This was a golden age for United and for Law. The United equaliser comes from Dennis Law. <laughs> David Hurd brought down a penalty. From the spot, Law makes no mistake. United again, and the great Dennis Law gets his hat-trick. Their hero, that fair-haired genius, Dennis Law. Over the next few years, Dennis stamped himself as one of the all-time greats. The Stretford End called him the King. He had pace, he had two feet, he had good control, skillful, could head the ball. What other qualities do you want? He was absolutely unbelievable. He was sensational in, in the air, he was very brave, and he would, it was, of course, he would, he would tilt at these windmills, you know, these great big center halves who used to come here. And he, and he didn't just tilt at them, you know, he'd have a go at them. And, and it was unusual for somebody as slight as him to be so aggressive. And, but he was, he was a brave player, great in the air, and just had this little, this little spark that's needed in a goal scorer. He just, he just found that little extra yard, was always in the right place at the right time, and had complete confidence, confidence when he got through with just the goalkeeper to beat. Everybody knows about, I mean, his sharpness in front of the goal was phenomenal. I've never seen anybody quicker over five, ten yards uh, in, in, the, in the penalty area. But also, it, a lot of people don't realise, you know, we, he, when he came deep uh, on, on the rare occasions, uh, his passing skills were, were tremendous as well. And I've already said, in the air, he was, he was, I've never seen anyone get up as well as he did. Dennis could turn on a sixpence. He could almost be a, a gymnast in, in his ability to, to score goals and take shots from, from impossible positions. That it was a fear that obviously built up inside you. I mean, you just had to be prepared for anything at any moment. Never once, if the ball was around Dennis Law, could you afford to relax. If you did, you often paid the price. He, he didn't have a weakness. I mean, as a player, um, if you if you really sort of sit down and analyse it, I think you know you could say people were were either stronger one way, or um, they didn't relish physical challenges, or they w they were not particularly quick. If you were super critical, but I, I mean, I don't think Dennis had a had a blemish in his in his makeup as a footballer. It's Carney now. Everybody talks about characters. But Dennis, he, the charisma he had, he lit the place up. Uh, when you were stood on the terrace in his abai, he just he was magical. Everything about him, be it to the linesman, the referee, whatever, the crowd responded to him. There was always something going on. And then I was fortunate when I had to sign apprentice and I got it first hand with him. It was tremendous. Dennis was far more than just a footballer. He was a great entertainer too. He seemed to want to please the crowds. People put that to me years later. I mean, I, I 
I didn't really, I, I, well, I didn't go out to do it intentionally. And if, if I did bring something to that side of it, i.e. when he scored a goal, I, you know, put the finger up or whatever, uh, that maybe would have been taken back from Icarus. And I always sort of held my uh, sleeve like that, you know, which was really a Scottish thing. Because you, know, well, you know the reason I did that was to wipe my nose. I didn't like short sleeves, see, because you couldn't wipe the nose. That was... <laughs> That's right, it's having serious conversations. If anything was coming into the box and you didn't get all of it quickly, or if, if, if there was any mistake at all, it'd be on and pounce. I mean, as, as you well know, and, and most people who, who watched him play, uh, he'd score most of his goals uh, round about the six-yard box. Uh, he was a brave lad. Uh, you'd go in there where angels fear to tread. his strengths were his pace I mean he was so quick um, his reflexes he could finish with either foot I mean he, he scored more goals um, of balls just dropping in the box hitting somebody and dropping uh, Dennis would be on it like a flash uh, the ball had come off the keeper only had to come off him a little bit and it was in Dennis might have pleased the crowds but he didn't always please referees he, he used to get sent off for some horrendous uh, things um, and it was always a record number of weeks that he was off. I think he was the first off for four weeks and then he was the first off for six weeks. And, and they all, it, we always used to joke about it because it always, it always came at the same time as the Christmas and the New Year holiday. To be fair, I suppose you've got to go back really to Man City. Uh, when we played Luton in the cup tie, uh, where we were trailing 2-0 and eventually we were leading 6-2. And it was absolutely, it was torrential rain and the referee abandoned the game with something like 20 minutes ago. And I, I had scored the, the six goals. And that was my, I suppose you say, my first hatred of referees started in that game. And then as... You know, we went into the sort of 60s. Ah, well, hey, my mother always said, you know, if somebody kicks you, kick them back. Because if you don't, then they'll keep on kicking you. So, so I suppose it was a philosophy that stood you in good stead sometimes, but in other times got you in trouble. So I was, I suppose I was a bit unfortunate being sent off. Uh, <laughs> I was sent off three times. But the good thing about it was I got suspended for a month, a month, and then six weeks. They were always at Christmas and New Year. So I had Christmas and New Year home in Aberdeen for three years on the bounce, which was absolutely lovely. Because all the lads were playing in a cold, two foot of snow or whatever, down back in Manchester or whatever they were playing. Well, I was up here in Aberdeen, cosy in front of the fire. Lovely. <laughs> In 1964, Dennis became only the second British player to be voted European Footballer of the Year, and United now gave him the international stage to display his skills. Lisbon kickoff attacking the goal this end. They say up here that Dennis Laws are finished inside forward, and here's a goal to prove it. Lisbon retaliates, just lacking the finishing power to equalise. Bobby Charlton's on top form these days. He nets United's second goal. The Portuguese goalkeeper, Cavallo, keeps out further trouble before the interval. United kick off in the second half. 2-0 is a useful score, but they need more if they're to go to Lisbon with a winning lead. 17-year-old George Best passes to Law and escape for Lisbon. Styles is fouled by Alfredo. A penalty beyond question. Law bangs it home. Lisbon are stung to all-out attack. Good work by Gascoigne saves Manchester United here. 
George Best centers to Charlton, and again the referee awards a penalty. There's some doubt about this one, and every Portuguese becomes as eloquent as Cassius Clay. Again, Law scores from the spot. Dennis holds the unique record of playing for Scotland, the English Football League, and the Italian League, who paid him in a pretty strange way. We didn't get paid in leave. We got paid in actual nuggets of gold. It was an actual nugget. I've never seen a nugget of gold in my life, but that was your fee. It was a nugget of gold. And I played against, we came over, we played against uh, England at Old Trafford. And that was the, the, the full England team as well. And we beat them 2-0. And then we came up and played Scotland at Hampden Park, which is obviously a much more difficult game. I mean, playing Scots. And we drew, I think it was nil-nil. It was 1-1 or nil-nil. It was a draw anyway. But our payment was in two absolute nuggets of gold, which, being Scottish, as soon as we go back to Italy, we sold. Never before, perhaps, has such an array of talent been assembled for one match, as we shall see in this game, representative of the 127 countries that play association football. In 1963, Dennis was honoured by being selected to play for the rest of the world against England in the FA Centenary game. He fitted in perfectly at the highest level. an outside chance to law. And what an escape for England as Dennis Law is just over with that shot. It's Di Stefano who starts an attack now. He passes to Law. To Hento at outside left. He centers, and what a relief for England when Di Stefano's shot is cleared. Pass in the middle finds Dennis Law. He eludes Banks and scores the equaliser. That was certainly a match worthy of the centenary of the FA, and what a triumph for England. Two unwinners of a game that will go down in history. Meanwhile, United were playing some great stuff in Europe. Probably the best we ever played was against Benfica in the quarter-final European Cup. We had played them the first game at Old Trafford, we beat them 3-2. Uh, and it was funny because we had played in Lisbon the year before against Sporting Lisbon. And we had beat them 4-1 at Old Trafford, which was an entry into the next round. But when we went to Lisbon that time, we got beat 5-1 five, five or 5-0, five, no, I can't remember, but it was an absolute disgrace anyway. So as we were on our way in the bus, that night to play Benfica, the sporting, uh, at the Stadium of Light. Everybody, all the Portuguese were giving us five, five, five. And of course, we thought, yeah, there's a fair chance that might happen. But of course, it didn't. Benfica kicked off with Eusebio, reckoned Europe's best player in evidence, though Manchester United's defence was not to be caught napping. Dennis Law and the rest of Matt Busby's men had only one thought, attack. But in fact, there was five goals scored but it was scored by Manchester United. And I would think that night was the sort of emergence of George Best as one of the best players uh, in European football. Another goal! Bobby Charlton started another attack. Heard to Connelly. Goal number three. At half-time, United 3, Benfica nil. A pass found Crerand. United's fourth goal. It was only right that Bobby Charlton should get one himself. Goal number five. And to control the game right from the beginning and give them a beating of five, which they probably never, ever had before or since was the most perfect match that we had ever played as a team. Bobby Charlton but United had to wait until 1968 to reach the European Cup final. And when Matt Busby's dream came true, Law was a notable absentee. I didn't play in the return game, the semi-final, which 
the lads two, three, three, to elect them to play Benfica in the final. And therefore I couldn't I couldn't very well get into the team then. You know, I'd missed the second game and all the lads who played in that game really they they deserved to go. So uh, whilst the whilst the players were playing at Wembley against Benfica and Busby said to me, what do you want to do? Do you want to come down for the final or what? I said, well, I'd rather get to hospital, get the cartilage operation done and give me more time to get fit for the beginning of the season. So while the lads were all enjoying themselves at Wembley, poor DL, I was in hospital having an operation. Dennis was back, though, for the World Club Championship the following season. The pitch was often more like a bear pit than a field of sports, and the audience didn't like it. Before United took a free kick... Studiantes means students. And I think the guy who was marking me was training to be a dentist. <laughs> Tried it with teeth out during the game. That bad-tempered match brought to a close a glorious era at Old Trafford and a great time for Dennis. In the 60s, it was obvious that the United side had probably the greatest forward line ever seen in an English club side, Best, Law and Charlton. This was magic in the making. Well, to be fair, I never thought of it like that at all. I just felt that you know, we were under a manager who enjoyed his football and, and of course, we had stinkers like everybody else, but you felt with those three in the side, that if I'm having a stinker, Best is not going to be having a stinker, or Bobby, or even if two of us are, there'll be the other one to do it. And that's, that is like really a perfect team, isn't it? Or near enough a perfect team. If somebody's not doing it one day, the others are doing it, because you can't always play well. He enjoyed it so much, and he wanted to, he wanted to make people enjoy it as well. And that's what I try to do. You know? And the two of us together, and uh, it was just, if you watch film clips of, of all of us, I mean, you can see when a goal scored. I mean, we were all, we were all friends in the team. Uh, there was no backstabbing, no little clicks. We, all, we were all friends. When we finished training, we went and had a, uh, a couple of pots of tea together and, and talked generally. And it was just, we were all friends. It was just nice to be part of the, the whole setup. Well, I feel very proud, really, because um, people always say that it was the golden age. You know? And they say, well, the best law in Charlton era. It was a period of time where every, every time you came down here, it was full. The dramatic things going on all the time, you know, European matches and uh, FA Cup ties. There, 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 was all, there was all generating tremendous enthusiasm for the fans and they just, they, they, and I'm proud to be part of that because it was, uh, it was unique. I think it's nice to uh, sort of be remembered um, in that light. And of course, at the time, you don't, you don't think of it like that. I mean, you are, you really, you are just playing your football and the, the if the accolades go to Bestie or the whatever to Bobby, it doesn't really, it's the team. And I mean, that's all cliches, really, but it is the team. And, it, and that was the most important thing. And as the years have gone on, yes, I think sometimes you become a better player when you're finished. Because as the years go on, people forget the bad games that you played. And really, the way that we've got, none of us ever played a bad game. And that's the beauty of aging. Nobody wants to age, but as you age, the memories of bad games go, they go fainter and fainter and fainter until, and now, every game I play for United, I played absolutely superb. A lot of rubbish, absolute rubbish, but that's how it happens. It's like everything else in life. Good times have got to come to an end, boy. The heart is willing, the head is willing, but the legs no longer can run or do the things that he wants. And it all sort of just fell apart. It was, it was sad the way that it happened, but, nah, well, we had a good time. 
Tommy Doherty came as manager and obviously he wanted to change the side, bring some young blood in, but, uh, and we won't go into it too deeply, but uh, he had promised certain things which didn't uh, materialise and I was up in Scotland and heard for the first time that I'd been given a free alongside Tony Dunn, but th those things are gone. So, but at the time, it was a very black day for me. To think, oh, I've been at United for years back. We all know things have got to end, but the way that it happened was, was quite sad, but... It's incredible how things change because within about a week, Manchester City asked me to go there. This is Dennis Law. Can he get in a shot? It's there. He's never been the greatest trainer in the world because he didn't have to do, because he was always he never carried any weight, but he was always a person that relied upon sharpness, which meant short, sharp bursts. But he was never a person that. Um, Went for shooting practice, for instance, you know, like we used to play. You play a fella on the edge of the six-yard box or the edge of the box, and you play a ball into it, and you plays him either side, and you have a shot at goal. Well, he never used to do that. He used to just stand on the six-yard box with his hands in his pocket, and anything that broke off the keeper, back of the net. If it broke an inch, it was there. The, w the reaction to the man is fantastic. That season at City was an absolutely lovely end to my career. Because apart from going to the League Cup, all right, we could beat in the final. Well, we didn't play at all, we were awful. Got back in Scotland, went to the World Cup. But prior to going to the World Cup, which, say it there, was a game that really will, I don't think it will ever leave me. And people say it put United down. It didn't actually put them down, because they had a couple of games left. It sort of pushed them a bit nearer it was our last game of the season at City, and United were having a bit of a bad time. They could go down, things are not looking too good. And I didn't particularly want to play in the game, but I had to play in the game. Equally, being a professional, I didn't want to go there and get beat. But I wasn't too bothered about winning, so a draw for me would be a perfect result. So the game has gone fine, 85 minutes, the game is lovely, huge crowd, and full house. Is away I hadn't got a clue where the goal was. No, I mean, not a clue. My back was to the goal. And I just instinctively back here. And I turned around. It's gone in the back of the net. And this is where you feel that the referee could have done something. I mean, he could have disallowed the goal. I mean, he could have given offside. I mean, he could have given it a foul. I could have given anything. He gave the goal. And I stayed away uh, very quiet, apart from City supporters on his side. Lee, pulled across for Law, Dennis has done it, that was to be the last time Dennis ever kicked a ball in league football. Dennis's football career at home might have ended, but his ambition to play in the World Cup finals for Scotland was about to be realised. Dennis was the youngest player ever to be capped by Scotland, and his patriotism, especially against the English, was legend. Was it to be the shape of things to come? Inside left for Scotland was Dennis Law, but spring it cut off an early effort. Yeah, I played against him for England. I don't know, I can't remember whether it was at Hamden or um, at Wembley, it doesn't really matter. But he hit me. I mean, he li literally hit me. Um, f fair time after the ball had gone, and I think he was making a point, really, you know, that I don't, I know I play with you every week, you know, but this is Scotland and uh, this is different. It's a little bit like a boxing thing when you, when you go to Hamden Park and what have you. And this, and, and this, this guy who I'd played with and been in digs with, he just absolutely looked straight through me. And I smiled and nodded, and I got nothing back at all. Uh, it, it, just as though he, he really hated me. And, uh, and it, it obviously, he fired himself up to be like that. And, uh, he was passionate about playing for, for Scotland. And I came face to face, stood opposite Dennis. And uh, I, was, I didn't know whether to shake hands. I was a new lad, like, type of thing. I didn't know the scene. I was looking whether they shook hands or whatever. And then the, Dennis just started at my toes. He looked straight from my toes, straight at my toes, all the way up, looked me straight in the face, and then just turned his head. 
and so obviously I knew what was in, in store. And uh, he says I whacked him straight away, but uh, it was him who whacked me, actually. He talked about nothing else but Scotland, Scotland, and, of course, stories of when we won the World Cup that he, he made a great point of saying that he didn't watch the World Cup. In fact, when Bobby and the team were playing that historic game, Dennis was out on the golf course playing a friend. All the members of the club knew I was out. On the, it was only two of the club. It's already down the rain. And as we came round, he beat me as well. But as we came round the corner, there are all the members there, and we went four, two, from England. I thought, oh no, it's the blackest day of my life. I mean, as you, as you think, I've got Nobby Styles and Bobby Charlton for the next four years. I, I, I'll not survive. I thought I was going to die. Revenge came the following year for Dennis and Scotland. Again. The men from north of the border were out to humble the Sassanachs and were confident they could. They weathered an early attack. After 19 games without defeat, England had the shock of their lives. Dennis Law scored for Scotland. Law and his teammates already scented victory. Maybe that escape galvanized Scotland into decisive action. Bremner had the ball. He passed to Law. To Lennox, and it was a Scot second goal. Barely 12 minutes left, and now England all but scored. John Gregg headed off the line. Then Law menaced the English defence. Only the genius of Banks prevented a goal. All hopes of an equaliser were shattered by Jim McCallion. A great match for McCallion, playing his first full international. Seven years later, Dennis played his last game in the World Cup against Zaire. I didn't feel that it was right to come back from the World Cup with your country and go into reserve team football. You do that when you're young. That's where you start. And I suppose a bit of pride, like we've all got at times. I, I didn't want to do that, so I just woke up one morning. Bank, it was August bank holiday, and I hadn't told my wife or anything. Uh, the, not, nobody. And I just went down and I said, I'm calling it a day. And that was the decision made. He was the king, the one and only king, you know. And he idolised him, and quite rightly so. And when he scored, he, he was special. And that's what people went to see. That's why they used to get 67,000 people going to watch Manchester United. And I can't tell you, about $60,000 went to see Dennis Law. That is how special he was. They'd want to go because they'd want to take their son or they'd want to go themselves and they'd want to be able to say, once it got to the latter years, <clears throat> to turn around and say, oh, I saw Dennis Law play. He was quite unbelievable. He was so special. He will be known as one of the great uh, footballers of all time, Dennis Law. So there's a person to think the world of him. He had tremendous natural talent and he was a great, great player. 